Hey guys, what's going on? This is Brian Abarca, your host for The Abarcast. I have a special guest today, Mr. Fernando Uribe. I know you. I personally know you. But for the people who are watching, following, please introduce yourself. Well, Brian, first of all, thanks for having me on the show here. And uh, it is Dr. Fernando Uribe. I am an accomplished educator, uh, award-winning philanthropist and journalist, and also certainly a very... I don't know, polarizing political commentator in Hudson County and also in New Jersey politics. So uh, I like to talk about everything and anything and uh, spice it up. So let's do that today. Guys, we're going to get very spicy today. Um, from what I know, from what you told me, Fernando, um, you are a host at one of your platforms, correct? You want to talk to talk to me about that real quick and introduce yourself with that? Well, sure. Um, first of all, I want to thank Brian because a few months back he was a gentleman to come on my podcast, Talk in the Hudson, which you can listen to on blogtalkradio.com slash Talk in the Hudson every week. Uh, I'm free of charge. You can download the episodes and listen to them from any platforms. But one of the things that I really took pl- you know pride in is the fact that you know doing media is hard, Brian. And the idea that I wanted to start a podcast in Hudson County that tackled not just only politics but issues that matter – to a population that's really, really diverse and that's changing, whether it's real estate, whether it's health and wellness, mental health, everything. And that wasn't really existing back in 2017. So I made a conscious decision on March the 1st to broadcast live every week. And again, I was like, if I get four listeners that week, I'll be happy. And sure enough, it was like two of them were my mom and dad. Um, And of course, my significant other at the time, but also at the same time. By the same token, like people gravitate towards my show and they respected it. And now it's grown into obviously the the very first and only weekly podcast in Hudson County politics. And it's still five years going strong. And it's not really about the awards or accolades. It's more about ha- giving people a platform to talk to and hear their local officials, to hear people that are prominent in the community like yourself. Like the fact that you are such an accomplished trainer, the fact that you are so well versed in what you do in your industry. I mean, that's something that I want to bring to my audience and say, you know what? This is going to be beneficial. This is going to be immensely helpful to them. And, uh, you know, since then, the podcast has still been really going strong. And that podcast that podcast that you're speaking about um, right now, um, is that the Talk of the Hudson? Yeah, it's Talk of the Hudson. Wednesday nights on Blog Talk Radio, yeah. Great, perfect. And you're also a host of uh, Real Talk with uh, Fernando Uribe via Jersey First TV. Yes, and that's that's on Monday nights nice. via Jersey First TV via their YouTube page and also on Facebook Live via StreamYard. And one of the things I take a lot of pride in is the fact that there aren't a lot of Hispanic journalists doing weekly shows. And I'm very unapologetic as a conservative. I don't really care who it offends, but there are... V- Listen, conservatism, I think, is something that's really embedded within the Hispanic community. We come from traditional families. We, you know, we grew up with traditional values. None of this Latinx nonsense, unless you're telling me you failed biology in high school, which obviously you you are if you're doing that by not saying that things are either Latino or Latina. So the idea that white woke people are trying to dictate to our community how to identify, I think, is insulting. So I try to be that Hispanic that is talking about kitchen table things meat and potato issues that matter to Hispanics, to Latinos, to Latinas. So we do that on Monday nights. I interview legislators, journalists, activists. I mean, I interview everybody from the most conservative to the most liberal and everybody in between. And it's a really, really good show with really organic traffic every week. Like not just tens and and hundreds. We're talking about like thousands of views every week. So I'm proud of that. Fernando, you do a lot of things. And then on top of that, you're also a professor, right? Correct. Yes. Jesus. I, uh, I teach at Burn Community College I, in the Division of Social Sciences. So really, again, because it's a community college, we're talking about a plethora of different majors. We're talking about everything from criminal justice to history to sociology to political science to urban studies. And it's a great program. I would argue it's one of the best community colleges in the state. And it's, you know, it's great to teach there. I try to just be this generic instructor that isn't so rigid. I get it. I was a student once. You were a student once. The idea of assigning 10 books up for, for a class is asinine to me because that means I have to read 10 books. I've read enough already. So I assign one book. I give a course load and a workload that's manageable because guess what? People have families. They have responsibility. They work. They have children. They have a lot of things on their plate. So why make their academic path more difficult? So I just try to be a realistic you know, instructor working there. I've also worked at other institutions as well on a part-time basis. Your alma mater, Montclair State University, William Patterson, Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, again, I really enjoy teaching in higher education. It's been 
probably the most fulfilling job I've ever had. Is that something you always wanted to do, teach? No, actually, my first job, and you'll laugh when I say this to you, but my first job out of college was working within criminal justice, working in the judiciary, working as a probation officer. I mean, I look like a bartender right now or like a bar manager. Most Listen, I'm, ju I'm just saying you told me you're going to take out the blazer, so I, I just had to step it up. Oh, no, I absolutely. usually come here with a T-shirt, so. No, no, listen, this is just me because <laughs> this is just my brand, but but a lot of people are, are, are taken back by that sort of admission where that first job out of college, like work in judiciary, working as a probation officer, working with people who are trying to get sometimes their second, third, fourth, fifth chances and trying to get it right in their life. So, you know, I've always enjoyed working in criminal justice. I made a, a great career out of it. I went to grad school during the meantime at Rutgers in Newark after going to completing my undergraduate studies in New Brunswick. But, you know, again, I, I've really, you know, I enjoyed working in criminal justice, but I said, do I want to do this for 20, 25 years and get a pension? That's great. But I felt I could do more. And when I went to grad school at Rutgers in Newark, when I got my, my master's degrees and then my PhD, I, I knew I wanted to teach. Mm. You know, I like talking. I'm Cuban, right? I'm also Colombian, but everyone says I'm Cuban in my mannerisms. Why not get paid to talk? So <laughs> let me take advantage of that. That's great. That's great, man. Now, since we're on the topic of um, school and college um, and majors, you know, I I'm I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I graduated from college as well, and if you didn't know this, um, I actually graduated from Pacific County Community College. So I'm a community college, you know, alumni as well. Now, being a graduate with an uh, associate's degree in exercise science from a community college, and also being a graduate from Montclair State University with an exercise science degree, um, I wanted to pick your mind on something, especially since you're a professor. You know. Picking a major in college is very, very difficult, especially as a student. Um, I, I can definitely relate. Um, I have a lot of clients that are young that can definitely relate. Um, if you want to, if you want to comment on, was it difficult for you to relate back? You know, back ten years ago, because you're not, you know, you're not older. But um, is it, is it hard? to pick a major when you analyze your student body? And if so, or if not, is there a certain major to choose in order to get into the job market? I tell my students all the time, pick a major that's going to make you the best candidate in the job market. I get it when we go to college. We're, listen, when we're 18 years old, 19 years old, we're, we're, we're all idealistic, right? We yeah. want to change the world. We want to tackle everything. And I tell my students all the time, pick a major realistically that's going to help enhance whatever skill set you have. And at the same token, pick a major that's going to help you get a job initially in this very competitive job market. And, you know, and I get a lot of trouble because whenever I'm representing the department at career fairs and everything, I'm really the only faculty member that's, that likes to go and sit there and talk to students. And they ask me, hey, Dr. Uribe, you know, what do you think about? I said, listen, and I don't really care how this sounds because it, it, you have to be transparent with students. Otherwise, they, they know you're full of crap. OK. And I say to them all the time, listen. You want to major in women's studies. You want to major in something in the humanities. I'm sorry. You can go to Barnes and Nobles, camp out for a weekend, fill your thermos up, okay, and learn about women's studies, okay? You don't need to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a major that, quite frankly, is not going to help you get a job. And now, again, some people might say, Fernando, that's a little hypocritical considering that you teach in the social sciences. But I'm, I'm consistent. If you want to go into education, if you want to go into government, nonprofit work, law school, Philanthropy. Yeah, there are a lot of social science majors that are worth it. Everything from political science to urban studies to history to criminal justice to sociology. But if you want to just say, well, I, I want to get a degree and I should expect to make X and X amount of money. No, it doesn't work that way. That's not realism in, in, in today's job market, especially when social media and, and technology has made it even better and more advantageous for you to be able to get employment and make money. But sometimes you don't need a degree. So I tell my students, be careful what you select. Be judicious, but at the same token, be smart because even, listen, case in point, here in New Jersey, a lot of families have the option after the Community College Relief Act that if you are if you have a, a gross household income of $65,000 or under, you can go to community college for free. So that's opening doors for a lot of low-income families. I hate to break it to you, $65,000 in New Jersey, that's kind of working class. That's not middle class anymore. That's not upper class. That's kind of working class numbers. So when you come from that household and New Jersey is making it available for students to go to community college for free, tuition free, and I believe also fee free. I don't, I'm not sure if books are involved, but I, I know the tuition and fees are waived. 
that's a great opportunity for not just 18, 19 year olds who maybe don't know what to do with their life yet. Not sure, hey, maybe I want to go to a four year college yet. Or even adults in their 20s and 30s that maybe are doing a whole new reboot of their life. Guess what? That's a great advantage to have. But when they're there, and I tell my students all the time, pick a major that's going to help you get a job. Again, women's studies is great, it's cute. Uh, Caribbean studies, poetry, folk dancing, that's, that's wonderful. You can learn that on your own. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars in your time when you can probably learn something else that's much more advantageous to you. Yeah, I, I, I understand that and I, I agree with it. You know, I always thought, especially nowadays in 2022, you know, being a millennial, um, that degrees are helpful, especially, especially if you need, if you need, you definitely need a degree to go into the career path of medicine and law, all right? But I always said this, and I'm going to stick by it, you know, networking is irreplaceable and is very ra- valuable. So if you end up meeting someone and you're, you're just a, um, a, a high school graduate and you have the connections there, you could easily work for Google, can you not? Absolutely. Again, degrees are important, and I always say this to my students. Depends on what sector you're looking to pursue. Again, if you're looking to get into government, you're looking yeah. to get into education, public service, nonprofit work. I mean, degrees are important, but you hit it on the head. Networking is crucial. That's why, if you notice, networking mixers now more than ever, again, as we're getting back to normal after COVID, but even pre-COVID, these networking mixers you'd see in Manhattan, listen, whether it's the Statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce that I'm a member of, or New York City Young Professionals, Hispanic Professionals, the Latino Chamber of Commerce, these are events that they're free. They don't cost you anything to go other than your time. Believe me, the ROI is worth it to you. And I say that to my students all the time. If you can go to networking events, go to them, meet people, come up with a resume. If you have a business card, come up with it. Even if your life experience or your work experience is minimal, go there, talk to people, make yourself an attractive person, not visually, but career academic wise and also professionally. In those settings, in those events, do you do you advertise that or market that um, or even tell your students at your college, because I remember when I was in Montclair State, you know, you're just overwhelmed with so many flyers. You're so overwhelmed. Or sometimes it's not even hung your up. Your inbox. And, your and inbox. You, and you have no idea what yeah. it is. And sometimes you get the – exactly. You get the emails. You get the inbox. And it's just – it's fucking spam. You know what I'm saying? So, like, um, are teachers usually told to kind of advertise and advocate for these these type of events? Or is it just kind of like, oh, you know, it's there. I did my job. You know, it's – it's to see if the students are going to catch bait or not. I tend to be not to be a conventional academic. I, whenever it comes to events like that, networking events and mixtures that are especially professionally based, I'm more than happy to always either print up a flyer, leave them in class and say, hey, by the way, listen, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is doing this. Check it out. Now, again, students are sometimes on a fixed income. We tend to be broke, right? Back in the day when we were undergrads, you know, we lived sort of paycheck to paycheck. We lived on cereal. I know I lived on cereal. I don't know about you, but I lived on cornflakes forever during my undergraduate years early on. But like for a lot of students, money isn't as abundant as, let's say, later on, hopefully when they're working. So I say, listen, this is free. It's not going to cost you anything. Go. You'd be surprised who you meet. Network. Get emails. If you can bring a resume, maybe. But you know what? Other than that, just make sure you get numbers. Because guess what? When you're able to network, that next network could be someone that really puts you on the trajectory to like an amazing career and job. So never, ever, ever turn those down, I tell my students. Mm. That's very informative. Yeah, no, when I was growing up, especially during my college day, uh, years, I was I was working at a commercial gym and I was making about maybe $60 an hour. So each, each session I would be making $30. Um, and that was a certain percentage of what my clients at a commercial gym was actually paying. So they were paying, can you believe they were, they, they would pay about $80 or $75 per session and for a half hour. And me as a trainer would own, only get 30, like $30 from that. So I, I, I would make really good money compared to the average college student. So I, you know, I can't say I could relate um, cause I was making decent money from there, but you know, everybody has their own route. Um, I mean, but that was definitely like your epiphany for like, I need to be an entrepreneur. I need to do this on my own. Yeah. You know, right? it, it was like, it was like a taste of, it was a taste of, you know, adult money 
You know, because not many people, you said it yourself earlier, not many people make that much money, you know, in let's say the lower class, because the middle class, you know, it's kind of up in the air now. Well, middle class, I mean, I would listen in New Jersey based on like the cost of living here and everything else. I mean, I would argue that the middle class is pretty much extinct now. You know, there's either working class, work, there's exactly. working poor. Yep. I'm sorry, there's famished, working poor, working class, and then pretty much upper class and then elite. Yeah. And I think for. You know, I mean, there's a lot of variables why the middle class has become extinct, especially in New Jersey. Right. But I would argue that, you know, really what's, you know, your net pay at the end of, the, of every pay cycle really, really differs now than it did even five, ten years ago. Right, right, right. Exactly. So, you know, just imagine me as a college kid, you know, 19, 20, 21. I was I was getting paid as a grown ass man. So, you know, with the taste of money and the taste of the possible success that's what kind of made me want to just thrive for more open up my own business etc you know and always network so everybody has their own path um but staying on the topic of of college you know i i i saw a recent stat and maybe you can agree maybe you cannot i just want to hear your your take on this fernando um women are most women are are in college compared to men. So not, in in other words, not many men are in college right now and about more than, uh, about 60 to 70% of the student body is female. Would you agree with that and why? Well, I would say yes. I mean, obviously there's a population growth of them. I mean, especially here in the, in the New Jersey, New York tri-state area, there are more women than men. I mean, the census tells us that, right? They Just even recently. But I would argue that more and more women are pursuing degrees, especially Latinas, like his, in the Hispanic community, it's sort of being really, really ingrained from a young age. Hey, be self-reliant, be independent, go to school, get an education. Where traditionally, let's say, again, in, in the Hispanic community, there was this sort of insistence on, well, you know, procreate, have a family. You don't really need to have a career per se. You can have a career, but prioritize family first. I think what we've been seeing in the last 20 years, and there's a lot of different variables for that, and, and we can get into that, but Women, I think, have, be have become preconditioned to go to college, get advanced degrees if you can, be in the job market, make your money, be prominent. And I think that that starts with going to college. More women, more, more women are getting degrees, not just Hispanics and Latinas, but, you know, women of color overall, even white women, too. You know, college educated women overall is that number has grown exponentially in the last quarter century. You think that's that's helping them um, in the long run? when they're ready to build a family? Well, I'll tell you right now, this is what I want to hear. I want, I want to get spicy right now. Um, here, Here's a hot take that's not going to sit well with a lot of people. I think that while careers are important, um, at the end of the day, the idea of not prioritizing family, I think, is hurting women in society. Not because as men, we, you know, the patriarchy, oh my God, you know, it's the evils. No, it's not about that. It's about the fact that Believing in in a traditional nuclear family, I think, is still important, and especially in our community, the Hispanic community, mm -hmm. I would argue that that needs to be kind of reinforced again. Where you know, women, yes, you can be independent, you can have careers. I I read an article in, in the New York Times Sunday Magazine a few weeks ago where Candace Bushnell. For everybody that knows Candace Bushnell, obviously she's the author of Sex in the City. It's what the the movie's based on. All her books. I had a chance to meet Candace Bushnell a couple of times at some book signings, and even now, recently, she's admitted, like in her late fifties now. Yeah, I look back, and I'm sort of paraphrasing what she said, but she was like, you know, looking back, I, I should have prioritized motherhood too. I should have maybe had a child. I put my career so much in, you know, in, in, in my vision that I looked in the back, back view mirror, and the idea of family and procreation didn't matter to me, and now I wish I had a family. I wish I had children. And you know what? I think a lot of women, once they start hitting their 40s and even 50s, are starting to feel that regret. They might not say it openly because of pride, mm. because, again, they don't want to – you know, feel like, oh, I don't want to subject myself to the patriarchy. It's I have not... my dogs. I have my cats. No, that's fine. But I mean, <laughs> the, the idea that you, you can believe in family doesn't mean that you're being submissive or that you're being, you know, oh, I'm acquiescing to the patriarchy. That's nonsense. Like, that's feminist BS. You know, that's prioritizing family, procreation and extending your family, I think, is a good thing. I, th I think we need, we need to get back to that. Right. At, at the end of the day, you know, us, not only women, but us men and women are here to procreate biologically we need to um us as men we need to build our legacy yeah. and then yeah. when we have children you know we can kind of live on through that legacy 
and we need women f for that and now with with women having that type of perspective it's kind of getting harder for for families to kind of stay together even kind of even build from the beginning i mean Brian, remember too like the idea that you know women by nature are maternal right. they're nurturers that's not a bad thing I, I think, you know, unfortunately, like feminism has done women a disservice for, I would argue, 50 years probably that, you know, oh, you know, it, it, we, we can't acquiesce to the patriarchy. We can't acquiesce to men. No one's saying you have to be submissive to men. OK, this is not some, you know, they act like it's a dictatorship. Yeah, it's not. And, and, and to me, what bothers me is that, listen, you can have a career, you can be self-reliant. But the importance of family, I think, as you mentioned, legacy, the importance of extending your family, having those roots in a community, right? I mean, again, he, he, here's some data that should not freak people out, but sort of remind you, everyone about the realities that, you know, the census data recently tells us that New Jersey and the country, it's not getting whiter, it's not getting blacker, it's getting browner. Mm. So Hispanics, indigenous people, just people of color in general that identify as brown, I mean, we're growing. Our families are growing. The idea that yes, they're they're going to college, but at the same time, they're creating more families. They're again, the idea that women should approach motherhood and embrace it is not a bad thing. Again, I would argue feminism has done women an immense disservice for half a century. About well, you know, you don't need men. Well, you kind of do, and we need women too. Okay, I think if we have some self awareness and we're a little transparent, we understand that the, the, that the two genders too right. need right. each other. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Now, you know, now that we're kind of getting to the spicy stuff, I want to ask you, what's your position on unequal pay? Especially, you know, I'm, I definitely wanted to save that question, especially for you, since you speak to a lot of politicians and people who, you know, are in law or in bodies of government, etc. Um, is it true? Is it false? Educate me a little bit. Well, I mean, it depends on the industry we're talking about here. I mean, if, you, if you're working in academia um, and let's say vacancies open up on college campuses and different universities, I mean, faculty jobs are faculty jobs. It's not based on gender. It's not based on race. Like what the starting pay is for, let's say, an associate professor, which is sort of like the first level and then assistant and then full professor. I mean, those numbers are pretty much ingrained into the Department of Education and the Department of Labor. Pretty much a lot of government jobs are based on that. I think when, when we talk about unequal pay and sort of, you know, the inequities that exist in this is really more in the private sector. We hear it, about, we, we hear it all the time in sports, right? I'm a big sports fan, you know, as, as I think you are as well. Definitely. I watch sports all the time. But what's interesting is, you know, for example, when I, when I hear people talk about the WNBA and women are not uh, being paid as equally as their male counterparts, well, here's a newsflash. You know, the NBA subsidizes the WNBA. So a large portion of revenues that come from the NBA go to pay these immensely talented female athletes. And again, I would argue that while women's basketball to some extent is compelling, it's not what it does for its male counterparts. What brings in more revenue? What gets more advertising? What gets more eyes on social media? I hate to break it to you, the ladies out there, it's men's sports. It's men's basketball, um, hockey to some extent, even men's soccer. Maybe not, for example, here in the United States, maybe not the men's team because the men's team never wins anything. But the women's soccer team obviously has won multiple women's World Cups. Right. Yes, and then we hear the, well, women should get paid. Yeah, but understand something. When we talk about the United States Soccer Federation, what's bringing in more revenue? What's bringing in more money? It's the men's sports. Okay, now, and also, too, again, not to pick on feminists, which I like to do on my shows a lot, but where women athletes are getting the most disservice paid to them is by women themselves. You know, I don't see feminists going to all these WNBA games or female games and being as rah-rah about these teams as they should be, okay? I bet you if you ask the common woman Facts. or the common yeah. feminist, is there a WNBA team in your city? They won't know. They won't even know the top three players on a team. Right. Support women. You know what? That entails going to games, putting your money where your mouth is. Exactly. And supporting them. So. As far as unequal pay, again, I, I would argue it's an issue in sports, but we also have to analyze who's bringing in revenues as opposed to other industries where the pay is pretty comparable. Right. And, uh, you know, there's there's recent there's recent news out now that even some women athletes are complaining now that transgenders are going into their sports and kind of just wiping out the competition. And now they're complaining. But then I thought it was just, you know, it was just all about – you know, equality and, you know, it's okay if men can do it and women can do it, et cetera. 
Well, it's funny you bring that up. I I interviewed the president of now the National Organization for Women here in New Jersey mm. uh, a couple months ago, and arguably probably the biggest feminist in the state of New Jersey, again, from an activism perspective. And we talked about this because I'm someone that is a very big sports fan. I believe in the legit- the legitimacy of records and stats. I'm a big numbers person. Okay, I don't have any kids that I know of. Okay, but if I had a daughter, <laughs> okay, that was playing sports, and I was pretty athletic back in the day. So, I mean, I played high school sports, whatever. So, I mean, I'd like to think hopefully if I, if I have a daughter that she would inherit some of my, my athleticism, I hope, or maybe surpasses it. I would be livid if I was a parent in a school district where, you know, biological girls have to now play second class citizen to boys who are now having some epiphany during adolescence or worse in college, where now grown ass men are taking, you know, testosterone suppressants or whatever else to compete as women. What does that say? Again, not to pick on feminists, which I like to do sometimes because it's fun. But what does it say about feminists? Why aren't you? Why am I the man? Stand up for biological girls. Why am I standing up for parents in this climate where they should be out there saying, hey, this is unfair to women. You know, women have it bad enough when it comes to sports. We see it in funding, right, in high school districts. Not all high school districts are funded the same. Right. And sports accordingly. Why aren't feminists and, you know, the woke crowd uh, all about supporting women? No, they don't want to offend. No. if you Listen, you believe in supporting women, support women. Okay, don't pussyfoot around it. Mm. Okay, don't listen. You you can't get just a little bit pregnant. You know what I'm saying? You, you're either all in or you're not. The idea that listen, I have my own ideas about transgendered people and and women specifically and men too. But when it comes to sports and the inequity that that creates, what does it say to girls? They're training their whole lives. They're practicing. They're working hard. And now a boy all of a sudden has this epiphany. Well, I want to be a girl now, and wants to play sports. Guess what? That scholarship that a girl was working hard for that maybe could get her out of a working class neighborhood and maybe into a better college or university, guess what? That'll be taken away. Oh, but we can't talk about it. The parents can't speak out because they'll be considered bigoted or intolerant. That's that's nonsense. And and, and I stand up against it all the time. Brian. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, um, since we're on this topic of gender roles and the differences between the two, you know, there's a huge, huge, huge um, misconception or misunderstanding between both genders over the wage gap. And I wanted to play a video from one of my favorite podcasts. Um, this podcast is number one for men. Um, it's called the Fresh and Fit Podcast. Shout out to you guys. Um, I wanted to play this clip It's one minute. It's nothing long, but it tells us about the difference between men and women in regards to the wage gap, and it explains why there's differences, if you want to take a listen. Absolutely, yeah. Great. This is incredible. Uh, I can't tell you how many women have come on this podcast and actually believe in the wage gap myth based on sexism. The wage gap exists because of choice, not sexism. The reality is this. The wage gap is nothing more than taking full-time working men, full-time working women, median wages, and comparing them. And when you do that, you find out men make a dollar for every 80 cents a woman makes. However, they don't account for degrees held, careers worked, Mm -hmm. the danger of the job, Mm -hmm. the type of job, hours worked, um, uh, time time taken off. Overtime. Mm -hmm. Overtime. They don't account for any of that. The reality is this, the top 10 paying jobs are male dominated, science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM. 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 The top 10 jobs that pay the least are female dominated, anything involving social work, teachers, etc. Mm-hmm. It's not that men make more money because they have balls, it's that men make more money because men decide to go into jobs. Gotcha, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, sorry. <laughs> uh, God damn it, Dave Chappelle. All right, so with that clip, you know, especially since you're in that realm of, you know, politicians and government, et cetera. You know, what's your position on 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 that clip on the wage gap? And is there an irony why politicians, especially presidential candidates, um, always talk about the wage gap and, oh, I'm going to raise, you know, equality for the wage and equal well, pay. Well, first of all, it, it, that's the prototypical definition of pandering. I mean, which politicians love to do during every election cycle. What people don't 
remember or that maybe they failed to realize is that, you know, President Kennedy, I believe it back in 1962, uh, signed the Equal Pay Act. OK, so the history professor here, you know, it's summer, but I'll have class for two seconds. President Kennedy signed that into law after Congress, you know, both chambers of Congress sent it, sent it to his desk. Now, what states choose to do? Brian, again, and this is, I hate to sort of evoke the Bill of Rights here, but if you, for all, everybody maybe who needs a civics lesson, you know, the Tenth Amendment is very specific about states' rights and federalism. And what states choose to do, again, is their business. President Kennedy, almost 50 years ago, okay, uh, if not maybe 60 years ago, excuse me, signed the Equal Pay Act. And whether or not it's been acted upon, well, we've had Republican presidents, Democratic presidents, Democratic Chambers of Commerce, Republican Chambers of Commerce, and they haven't acted on it. So when I hear this this pandering every election cycle, well, we need equal pay. But equal pay for what specifically? I mean, that clip, I think, really itemizes exactly where cutting out sort of like the nonsense and cutting through the layers and getting to the core of the apple, where what professions are men pursuing and what professions are women pursuing? And again, if you're working in government, if you're working in education, those by and large tend to be lower paying jobs. They're set jobs because they're set by, by steps, right? A certain pay range based on time worked. That's not the way it works in the private sector. Promotions happen all the time where, guess what? It's not predicated on steps. Maybe there's some contractual language that we can talk about. But at the end of the day, the notion that, well, women aren't paid. Well, again, are, are women taking these jobs that are more labor intensive? Are women wor- willing to work 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week? Listen, some men might don't want to do that either. But if men are choosing those careers and choosing to work those hours, they shouldn't be penalized for it. And if women aren't willing to work those same amount of hours, should we just now all of a sudden create a parity because, well, we just have to have equal pay. But are you willing to do equal work? That's the issue yeah, that exactly. I take exception with. Exactly. And, you know, if if this wage gap was was actually, you know, concrete, you can argue that if women were paid lower and they were actually cheaper to employ, wouldn't we as business owners employ them instead of, uh, you know, the opposite sex? No, they, would be, they, w- they would be cheaper. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Again, it goes back to people need to know their history. People need to know their facts when it comes to equal pay. As I said, 60 years ago, President of the United States, okay, signed the Equal Pay Act. Why has it been acted on? Again, I can't speak for every politician in the last 60 years, but it becomes such a polarizing talking point politically and economically every election cycle. And again, if if you know your history and you know your facts, you see through that nonsense. You see through it because it becomes pandering. It becomes just simply acquiescing to a political ideology that sometimes isn't always based in, 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 in fact, Brian. Right. And you know what? And it's... I want to seem like I'm I'm picking on on women here because it's it's not their fault. It's just you know it's it's their choice. You know what you could say is their fault because it's their choice, but it's indirectly not their fault because they're just more social beings. You know, us men we just we want to get paid more and we want we're willing to die in jobs. You know, we're ready to risk a little bit more, like our life, than you know, other jobs that are a little bit more social, like social work, et cetera. Well, I mean, Brian, too, I was remembering, too, I think the element of gender roles comes into this as well, but where men, again, yeah. from the beginning of time have been preconditioned to be the providers. Exactly. Where women, again, they're the nurturers, they're maternal, right. okay? And at some point when women realize that family is important, they may not take that job that's going to be as intensive hours-wise because they want to prioritize family. Not to say men don't prioritize, but at the end of the day, like, as the man... What are you doing? Like you're providing for family. So if you're going to work 80 hours as opposed to your wife working 40, but you're seeing the equilibrium in the family, you're seeing harmony within the family structure, men are willing to compromise that. Is every woman willing to do that? I don't know. I can't speak for every woman, nor can I speak for every man, but I think men by and large are willing to sort of say die on that hill for that. Right, right. You know, most women would just, would they, they would be okay and it, they should be okay to, you know, raise their children. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's almost like like those gender roles. It's, it's almost like as if would you hire a male dominated child care place or a woman dominated child care place? It's almost like, you know, there's nothing against men taking care of children, but I would be more comfortable leaving my kid in a woman child care place center. And, w- and why is that? Because women are maternal. They're the nurturers. 
There's nothing wrong with that. I, again, I think the idea. We, I think, Brian, I think we have to, as a society, get past this, this demonization of motherhood yeah. and 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 again the gender roles. It's not me being a misogynist, which I can be. I've been accused of that. It's not me being sexist. It's about understanding that men have certain roles, women have certain roles, and that's happens to be. Can they evolve? Can they transition to different things? Absolutely. But when it comes to raising children, listen, paid paternity leave is wonderful. But at the end of the day, I, I would rather want my significant other, the mother of my child or children, to be home. Not to say I can't take care of children, but I would want the mother to be there. Why? Because boys and girls need their mothers, okay, or need a, a maternal structure. I grew up, again, my parents worked. My mom worked during the day. My dad worked at night. I had the luxury, thank the Lord, and God rest her soul, my grandmother, you know, who took care of me from a very young age. Why? Uh, they would, I, th- I think that's just more, uh, th- that's a Spanish thing. Because, uh, you know, my definitely. grandparents raised me yeah, too. Yeah, and, and I grew up with my grandma and my grandfather. My grandfather passed in 94, but my, my grandmother, thank the Lord, lived to 102. She wow. passed in literally right in the middle of COVID, right in 2020. But I was raised with her. And why? Because my mom and my dad knew there was a nurturing aspect to my grandmother vis a vis by osmosis by my mother that was going to be beneficial to me. And it is to every child. I don't want to hear this nonsense that, no, you know, it's, it doesn't really matter. Yes, it does matter. Children need their mothers. Mothers need to be present for their children. Speaking about roles, let's get even spicier, Fernando. All right. All right. Let's Please. go. Let's go. I want to speak about, you know, let's start with men because we, we don't want to look like misogynists here. What do you think men bring to the table in a relationship? Well, well, a couple of things here. Let me keep it as PG as possible. Um, if they know what they're doing, obviously they can keep a woman, right? But aside from that, I think it's the structure that we're expected to have. You know, as men, we're supposed to have our... I'll say we're supposed to have our shit together by a certain age, okay? We're supposed to be grounded, hopefully financially stable, uh, being able to prioritize career, okay? Yes, we like to party and, and, and go out and travel, but by a certain age, men have to have their shit together. And I would argue that we live in such a cosmopolitan area where, unfortunately, like we're kind of delaying adulthood, for a lot of men and women, I think. But more so for men, the idea is that we're supposed to come to the table with some structure. And I think women look at that and say, you know what? Let's check off some boxes here. What does this guy bring to the table besides money? Is he financially stable? Does he own a house? Does he own Does he own property? But is he stable? Okay. I think women look at men through that prism of, hey, let, let me look at this box here. Look at this checklist. Let me see what this guy checks off for me. Yeah, looks and this and that, a car, whatever. Those are, that, that's superficial shit, you know? It's more about, hey, is this a guy that's going to help provide for me, be a solid husband, a f- solid father? Is this a guy that I know that can help manage a household? And I think women look at it that way. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It doesn't mean that we're being weak or that we're, acqu- we're acquiescing to women. Bro, we're, we're men. We're the providers, Okay, from the beginning of time, what did women do? They stayed in the cave and we went out, you know, hunting for food and sometimes they get our ass killed. Okay, but we went out hunting for food. Why? Because we had to provide for women and the children. That's something that's been embedded in us, not just in the Hispanic community, but I think for men in general. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Yeah, you know, they expect that. But do you think, let me just push back a little bit. Do you think that same thought process is in the minds of but the boss babes and the independent women and the women that, you know, think that men ain't shit? Well, alpha females are a pain in the ass. Uh, let me just put that out there right now. Alpha females, and I've dated a lot of alpha females. They, Yeah, they're, they're, they're listen, especially the hot ones, they're nice to look at. They're great ar- eye candy, arm candy to walk into wherever. But it, it's also about understanding where they're coming from but being able to balance it out. And I think as men... You know, I would argue that there's this climate out here that we're trying to minimize masculinity. We're trying to make men less masculine. Like, I think I think that's an epidemic. Oh, that's right. I think it is an epidemic. I think it's a pandemic too. I hate to use that word, obviously, but I mean it is an epidemic where we should be men. There's nothing wrong. This idea of tox- toxic masculinity, I think, is nonsense because if we're going to have toxic masculinity and discuss it, guess what? There's toxic femininity, mm. and I would argue that toxic femininity is worse than toxic masculinity why is that so i would argue listen i i think there's an element when it comes to either dating or date or dealing with women 
bro, women have been taught from a young age to weaponize their vaginas and use it to their advantage, whether in the workplace, whether in dating, whether in marriages. And listen, I see it specifically in, in, in Hispanic culture. Latinas have been taught at a very young age. I weaponize this. I'm going to get what I want, when I want, whenever I want. And men, unfortunately, let's be honest, we acquiesce to it. Okay? Not to say that we're suckers, but we acquiesce to it. You know, most again, of, most of us. Most there, of us. There's exceptions. No, there are exceptions. But but, but understand understand this too. Like the idea that as men, we shouldn't be apologizing for being men. Mm. We should embrace that. We should right. be we should be just projecting it. Like case in point, a, a few months ago, I was one of the happiest people for Johnny Depp when he won, because Johnny Depp was a, he was an example of how the Me Too culture got perverted, and pretty much like not to say that we shouldn't believe women we should i mean sexual assault is still a serious problem in this country according to data but when i saw johnny depp win that case it's like wow good for john because you know what here's a guy whose reputation got dragged through the mud he lost jobs potentially future earnings that he may never get back yeah all of a sudden disney now is kissing his ass to come back for pirates of the caribbean but guess what that doesn't always work out for every man and johnny has the advantage of having an attorney and he has millions of dollars how about regular men like you and me the average man you know women can't afford that. women can cancel us real quick women can 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 ostracize us and minimize us quick so, so i would just say that you know the idea about men we should embrace manhood we should embrace masculinity because again it doesn't make us less of men to do that the idea that listen you, you you can be sensitive, you can be consoling and, and, and understanding of women's needs and their emotions. That's fine. That means you're evolving as a human being. That means you're maturing. doesn't mean you have to sort of lose sight of who you are as a man. And I, th- I just think we're, we're getting away from that for the idea that, and also too, listen, alpha females don't really help the issue either because alpha females, I think, can be insufferable. They can be hard to manage. And if you're an alpha male, not to say that I need a submissive female, but I want a woman that kind of meets me halfway, but doesn't feel the need to sort of overwhelm me at every turn because she needs to be right or she needs to win. It's not about winning or being right. It's about like, yo, can you can you coincide as a couple? Can you meet halfway? Can, can you meet in the middle and say, you know what? I want to build a future with you. I want to own property with you. I want to own a business with you. And if you can't do that with a woman, then what are you doing? You personally, would you... Would you open up a business with a woman? Let's say hypothetically in the scenario where you're married and hypothetically you end up getting divorced and hypothetically that woman is entitled to half your shit. Well, he, well, here's an interesting thing. I'm someone that when I've talked about marriage with, with different females, I mean, I've always been a fan of prenups and I've been very, very upfront about that. Like, listen, you know, I own property. My family owns property. Not to say I'm super well off, but I mean, I want to make sure I keep what's mine. I'm not out for your money, but let me keep what, what I've worked for and what my family has worked for. So when it comes to you know that sort of arrangement, would I open up a business with my wife? It depends what we're doing, Brian. I mean, it really, really does. I mean, I'm someone that works in academia. I'm someone that's building a media brand. So at the end of the day, like you know, I look at it from my own personal perspective. Like, do I need my wife to be involved in my day to day operations about my media brand? No. You know, I'm not starting up a network tomorrow. But, I'm, but I have a brand that's ongoing. Do I want a woman to help me manage or help me manage my finances or, you know, be someone that I can look for for guidance or insight? Absolutely. But in my scenario, I wouldn't open a business with my wife because it doesn't suit me. It doesn't benefit me. For men out there, be very judicious because, you know, money does strange things to people, both men and women. So once you do that and if things are outlined and ironclad, it could become disastrous real quick. Yeah, you know, I think, I think, you know, with marriage, um, I, you know, I was open to marriage until up re- recently, like maybe in the past few months, I changed my mind and I was just kind of like, you know what, thinking about it, marriage is only for women, you know, it's for, it's for the clout of women, women end up winning with marriage, women get the yeah. engagement ring, they could flex with the, with their girlfriends, you know, I don't win anything with marriage, shit. You know, and and they get the wedding, they get the ring, then they the get the bridal shower before that. Remember the bridal shower? The, the, there's the bridal shower, baby shower too. Maybe there's you, a baby yeah. a baby shower. Yeah, there's yeah. a gender reveal, oh, and all the presents are for for the woman. Like it's not it's not for the man. You know, we're just there in a the corner, like holy shit, when is this shit gonna be over? Oh, but we just put the sperm. That's what we did. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> I we, know we, that's what we did. So yeah. you know, I thought about it. and I was like, you know what? Like 
that's the engagement right there is what uh engagement ring is what thirty thousand forty thousand dollars then let's say the wedding especially post covid you know i have a few f family members and friends that got married and they spent well over a hundred thousand dollars it's like do i really want to just pay a hundred fifty thousand dollars for something for my only for my wife when like uh, for a man it doesn't really benefit me i could just have that uh, that those six figures invest in maybe in a, in a house or real estate and you know if if i'm gonna be that in that route or in that position i could you know grow something with my women but like at the end of the day it's like no i'm just paying $150,000 for just one day and it's for what it's it's for the guests to enjoy it's not even for us it's funny about marriage I, I've said this consistently men marry uh, again ladies and be very make sure you don't take this out of context all right when everyone at home to make sure they're listening carefully here men marry who they want women marry who they can and I'll explain that in your case clearly you are someone that has soured on marriage or is not a fan of marriage so it's going to take something immensely cataclysmic for you to change your mind about marriage. So when I say men marry who they want, it's because if they choose not to get married, there's no other than physically restraining a guy and holding him at gunpoint. But willfully, if they don't want to get married, they won't. Women marry who they can. This idea, oh, well, women marry with, you know, who they want. No, that's not true. Women marry who they can. Because at the end of the day, if a man just doesn't want to get married, if a man just does not want to settle into that contract okay then that's not going to happen okay marriage is sex is very different right like men have sex when they can women have sex when they want it's a little bit different it's, it's the opposite with, with 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 marriage and i think that that's one of the things that really is interesting about sort of distinguishing what men and women go through but back to your point about marriage it's listen i'm still a fan of marriage I still approach dating with the purpose of marriage. I'm actually approaching dating differently now because of the fact that I'm really sort of insistent on procreating. Like, I want to have a child. That's the way I approach dating. That's the way I'm approaching dating now with who I'm seeing. Legacy. Exactly. Legacy. You know, preferably boys because boys are easier to take care of and they're more affordable. I, I don't want to deal with quinceañera. I don't want to deal with everything else that deals with having to raise a girl. I, I, I've dated women that, that raise daughters and, and all that, and I don't want to deal with that stuff. So, so for me, the idea that, hey, I'm looking at it as... Poor creation is important. What, what I, I've been married before. I was married in my 20s for two years, not very long. I'm not opposed to the idea of marriage. But for me right now, my insistence is having a baby. So when I look at dating and I look at my partner, I look at it as for the point of, well, yeah, okay, I, I, I just don't want to just knock up any woman. I want to be able to you know, have a future with a woman that meets everything on my checklist. Yeah, criteria. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. But again... I'm looking at it differently where like marriage isn't the most important thing for me right now, but having a baby is or maybe more multiple children. Like That's my agenda and that's my itinerary right now. I'm not saying everyone's the same, but I think in your case, you know, you look differently at marriage. I'm receptive to marriage. It's not something, but I'm also of the type that, hey, listen, I'm, I'm good with City Hall. You know, I dated a woman uh, some years ago where we were like when we talked about marriage, I said, hey, are you good with City Hall? Right. And she was like, yeah, I'm good with City Hall. And the reason was that not to sort of bore the audience, but like we were we were very much Sex in the City fans. So the idea of Big and Carrie getting married at City Hall, ultimately, that was the end story. We were fine with that because we we're like, you know what, let's take that money, save it, invest in either a house or something that we can invest in as a couple. Because you'll be we'll be Mr. and Mrs. Uribe. Let's do that as opposed to spending, you know, I don't know, a quarter of a billion dollars on a wedding and everything else that goes into it. You know, just like you said, men marry who they want. You know, I think there's argument that a woman can have a child whenever they want as well. That's right. You know, and um, they have, especially now at times where the A word is very, very popular um, and clickbaity, they have the choice to either abort or keep the child. Now, that being said, I kind of want to play another video, um, not to trigger anyone, Okay. Yeah, let's trigger people. I trigger people every week. I mean, why not? Let's trigger people. That's cool. <laughs> but uh, you know this this video just kind of explains. You know, it's explains why it's only a woman's choice and men do not really have a say in it. And again, it's with you know my favorite podcast. Oh, by the way, the, your your iPhone's on low, so I think it stopped recording live. I'm not sure. Oh if it's man. Still, yeah, it stopped doing recording. Yeah, yeah. So. 
I appreciate that. Just looking out for you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. All right. Are we back all right? Come on. Oh, that's fine. Now here this here's a video, guys. Real quick. Whose fault is it though? Yeah. Whose fault is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's if it's a woman is pregnant and has a child or whatever, it's hundred percent her fault. She can choose her to keep fault. it or not. Mm. Ooh, more <laughs> controversial <laughs> stuff. Well he should have pulled out. He should have pulled out. Okay. I feel like it's definitely both. Or why like, didn't you wear a condom? That's on the guy, too. I feel yeah. like it's 50-50. Yeah, it's definitely both. Yeah. No, it's ladies. Definitely it takes two to tangle. Hold on. Because <laughs> <laughs> we had this discussion before yeah. uh, on another show. If you had a million dollars, right? Actually, uh, no, let me let me switch it up for all the ladies in here. Let's say I have a million dollars, right? You have no access to spend it, though. But it's both of our million dollars. You can't spend it. Only I can. And I spend it. I buy hookers, blow... Buy a Corvette here, take another girl on a trip here, buy a bunch of bags, shopping spree, whatever, and I run out and run out of money, and I come back and say, hey, what the fuck? We're out of money. This is your fault. Are you responsible for that? When you had no access to the money? No. No? No, but... No, but that's not a good way to, like... Hold on, I'm going to explain it here in a second. I'm going to explain it here in a second. I'm going to explain it here in a second why I'm saying that. No? No? No. Yes. Okay. So, okay, you're still responsible for the for the million I spent. Yes, okay. it's our money, right? Okay. Did I advise you? <laughs> <laughs> no, you have no say in it. Okay, then have, no. Okay. No? Ms. Venezuela? No, but that wasn't a good analogy. No, I'm going to explain why. It's, hold on, hold on. I'm going to explain why it's a good analogy right now, ladies. You ready? All right. Women have a 100% monopoly on who gets born and who gets aborted. If I want to have the kid and you're pregnant, I can't tell you to have the kid. You can say, fuck you, I'm not having a kid, and abort the child, and vice versa. If you want to have the kid, I say abort it. I have no say in it. So you cannot give anyone responsibility when they don't have authority. I'm going to say that again because a lot of women don't like hearing this. You can't give someone responsibility when they had zero authority. You have 100% authority on who's born in the United States. I have zero. Therefore, you are responsible, not the man. And I know you guys don't like hearing that because it takes two to tango, but, but unfortunately, there's some states that you can't even have abortions. Yeah, and countries as well. Yeah. Also, it's no. our body, so shouldn't and then we? Exactly. And, 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 and then your body has to go Thank you. Your body, your choice. Thank you. Your yeah. body, your choice. No, Just like it's your you body that you put your dick in the girl. And could have pulled out. You could have pulled out. Hold on, hold on. Your body. <laughs> Once again, let's go back. I love this because a lot of women don't like having accountability. <laughs> who chooses who has sex? Two people. Both. No. 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 Women. Both. Women choose who has sex and who does not. If both parties had, you know, an equal opportunity to get sex, we wouldn't have 80% of men sexless, sexless right now. Women have 100% monopoly on who has sex and who's born and who's not in the United States. And on top of that, I get what you're saying, some states don't allow abortion. You could drive over to another state. Most states, United States, allow for abortion, and I have no say so. You said pro-choice. Agreed. Which means pro-responsibility as well. I have no choice. So you cannot make me responsible. It is the woman's fault if she has a child or aborts it, period. There's a nice quote. Real quick, real quick, right? There's a quote that's going on right now. All right, guys, so that was the video. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm pro-choice. Me too. You know, I'm, I'm pro-choice. That, that, that's, that's my position. A woman, it's, it's a woman's decision. Within reason, right? Yeah, because, yeah. you know, we can't control. Once, once we finish inside them, whether we want to or not, or someone can't control themselves, right? We have no control after, you know, like, like, oh, my God, Myron says, if I wanted to keep the baby and the woman does not want to, at the end of the day, it's going to be the woman's decision and then vice versa. If I don't want to and she wants to keep it, it's still going to be her decision. What's your reaction on that video? Well, first of all, it was really insightful and I, I, I'm definitely going to start subscribing to these guys because they're very, very, very informative, but you know, he touched upon something very, very interesting about accountability. And at the end of the day, you know, and, and you, you bring up the abortion word and that's a very polarizing topic. I and mean, I've been talking about this extensively on my show with different legislators and activists. And it was interesting because I remember just a few months ago, I had the president of now the National Organization for Women on in New Jersey, the president who's arguably probably the biggest feminist in, in, in the state of New Jersey. And coincidentally, that during that episode on that Monday night, we talked about reproductive rights and in New Jersey where, let's be honest, I mean, women, when it comes to reproductive freedom, have it as good as they do in New York. 
And coincidentally, as we were sort of having a playful argument about, you know, abortion and whether or not, and she was terrified. She's like, well, you know, with the Supreme Court and its makeup right now, you know, Roe versus Wade could get overturned any day now. And I and I looked at her dead on in, in, in the show and I was like, nah, don't worry about it. That's not going to happen. Sure enough, three hours later, the word leaked out about the, the Supreme Court case and, and she called these. They have every right and every access to it. So I don't want to hear anything about, well, women's rights are being infringed. Depends on the state you live in. Let those states govern the way they do. You live here in New Jersey. Stop your bitching and moaning because you have it pretty easy here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I agree. You know, at the end of the day, just like, just like I said earlier, you know, women are, are more social. They interact more. You know, it's it's more about tribism. So, just because, and again, we could uh, d- disagree on on this topic, Fernando, but. You know, just because they're not living in that state, they're still going to feel some type of way, which I completely understand. That's fair. It, That's it, fair. It's a tribalism That's type of thing. That's fair. You know, like for, for, for us guys, or at least most guys, you know, we don't we don't give a shit what's going on in fucking Texas. You know, but for women in Jersey or women in New York, et cetera, they're going to give a damn for some reason. I don't know why, but they do. Um, you said and, perfectly tribalism. That's a perfect word. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, and on top of that, not many people know this, but the states had the decision in the past to we- to whether legalize or illegalize. Well, to regulate it ultimately. Yeah. Abortion. A- absolutely. Yeah. You know, it was it was it was from the state, went federal and now it just went back to the state. So not many people, especially millennials, not many, not many n- millennials know knew that, you know, Um so yeah, I mean, I mean to your point, like again, people don't do enough reading comprehension. Yeah, I mean, get, get off of TikTok, get off of. It's Snapchat. a title. It's a title. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do some basic reading, and you'll realize that I'm right, which I tend to be often on my show. But I mean, I'm not trying to oversell it. But the the the, the point is that do some reading because you'll understand that. What that long litigation was predicated on is again, is just simply saying let the states regulate this. Listen, it's no different than marijuana. Okay, I don't give you. You might say, Fernando, what? I'm like, hear me out. Okay, two years, three years ago, okay, the legislature said, hey, we can't decide whether or not to criminalize marijuana or whether or not to legalize it. Let's put it on a ballot. Let's let New Jerseyans decide. Okay, great. And guess what? In 2020, despite everything that went on with COVID and all the madness with that election and everything, here in New Jersey, okay, 67% of New Jersey voters told the legislature, hey, we want recreational marijuana available, we want to decriminalize, and we want to make this where it's a revenue-generating industry. And that's what's been going on with the Cannabis Commission in Trenton. Guess what? In Texas, okay, uh, Iman Shumpert, I believe, got picked up with like less than a gram of marijuana again. Why? Well, in the state of Texas, marijuana is still illegal. It's not been decriminalized. So I, I hear people saying, well, this is so wrong. Again, it's the state of Texas. Marijuana is not decriminalized federally. So, again, until it's ap- approached at a federal level, the state's going to do what they want to do with it. So, again, either you believe in states' rights or you don't. And I understand abortion's a polarizing issue. Yeah, you can't be a hypocrite and be like, you know what, I, I'm 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 for states here, but states shouldn't do this. And absolutely, you can't Brian. do that. Absolutely, you can't do that. Absolutely, you know. And at the end of the day, you know, if if women or families, men and women, decide to do what they got to do with their offspring, they could easily just drive. Do you guys have to fucking you know announce it to the world and then you know get into trouble with the law no just do it in your private time and nobody's gonna know you don't have to announce it on instagram like everybody does exactly yes you know um so that was a long long topic of what do men bring to the table <laughs> okay but you know just to play devil's advocate what do you think women bring to the table in relationships all right let me keep it pg here uh the right type of woman right uh you don't hopefully, have to keep it PG. You know? ho- hopefully, great sex. Number one. <laughs> hopefully, great sex. Okay. Uh, but besides sex, no, 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 you I, know, I, that's obvious. No, no, I know. Obviously, uh, something visual, right? You can bring her to your barbecues and friends and show her off because she's a great eye candy. Yeah, and to candy. the family too. You know, exactly. for my grandmother, my grandmother wants to see you know some eye candy as well. Exactly. It's it's like wait a minute, Fernandito. Oh, of course, bonita. Está con Fernandito, of course, right? So I've always heard my whole life, right? But this is the thing. I would argue that. What women bring to the table, again, hopefully, just like men, is the ability to make sure that they have their shit together, too. And I think that, especially here in the New Jersey, New York area, and I, I can speak a little bit for Miami. I have tons of friends that live in Miami that date Miami and L.A. and Vegas, very cosmopolitan cities. 
I think the idea of what women feel they should bring to the table has really, really changed. Yes, you can have a career. You can have your own money. But the idea that at the end of the day, and I know it sounds very, very hypocritical, well, stereotypical more so than anything, as, as you know, especially in our culture, but men want to look at women as a complete, decent presentation. Like someone you want to be able to bring home to your mom and dad and your extended family and say, hey, listen, this is someone I want to build a future with. And I, and I would argue that women, hopefully, I think, do approach it that way too. They want to be marketable, just like I think men want to be marketable. Right. Oh, bring him home to mom. See what mom's think. What mom thinks. Same thing. Bring her home to mom and dad. See what they think. Bro, in our community, let me tell you something. Hispanic moms and dads are the most judgmental creatures on the planet. Very, especially oh. Peruvian. I'm half Peruvian. Okay. And shit, you'll get roasted. Okay. I mean, I'm Cuban, Colombian, Spaniard. Okay. I think my mom being Cuban, I mean, she's as guarded as it is about her only son. That's let's start with that. Number two, the idea that, and I know it sounds very, very draconian, but it's the truth, bro. There are just gender roles that we allocate to men and women and behaviors and what they should be and should not be doing. I cannot begin to tell you. I don't have, listen, if, if I had a dollar for every time I brought a girl home that couldn't hold her liquor, I would have paid off my loans already. I don't have to wait for Sleepy Joe to do it, right, because I'm still waiting. But this is the thing where there's just this perception, like, bring a woman home that's decent, a woman that knows how to be a lady, that knows how to conduct themselves. How many times do we have parents, right, that have children that will date their significant other and they're sloppy drunks or they're angry drunks or they're belligerent drunks. And I hate to break it to you, and I know this might sound bad, but especially with Latinas, some Latinas can't hold their liquor. And when they can't hold their liquor, boy, oh, it becomes toxic. It becomes belligerent. Damn, does it have to be Latinas, though? It could be. Well, more, it could be no, no. no. Well, in fairness, I, I, listen, I went through a phase where I dated a lot of Eastern European women, like like Polish women, Russian, Ukrainian oh, women. Oh, they could handle vodka. They can handle vodka, but they can still be as sloppy. They can still be as angry. They can still shave off your eyebrows when you're sleeping. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, that that's the thing. So what I would argue that, again, to your point about what women bring to the table, I think ultimately they want to be looked upon as a good candidate because, you know, as a wife, as a mother, as a partner, because not every relationship has to, you know, end up in procreating. OK, um, some women are just, you know, very into themselves, right, into their careers, into being self-sufficient. Unfortunately, some women are, I mean, are so into their pets, for example, it drives you crazy. Right. They love their dogs and cats more than people. And I'm just like, OK, well, you know, what else are we bring to the table? But for women, I think I think there's unfortunately, you know, and there's no way to say this, but women face a lot of undue pressure because they have to act a certain way, be a certain way. And if they don't fulfill those expectations, there's a stigma to them. OK, I'm in my mid 40s. OK, Brian, um, the fact that I'm single and that I'm still a bachelor. Yeah. You know, we might get I might get that occasional side. eye. oh, well, what's wrong with Fernando? But a woman in her mid to late 40s and she has no children and she's not married, oof, it's red flag central. And let's be real, that's the truth, bro. In any community, I'm not just saying Hispanic or Latina community, but those gender roles unfortunately exist. You know, we can get away with that for so long. Okay, we can be we can be in our 50s as men and have a career and be bachelors and be successful, but a woman? And, and guys, that's not our fault. No. That, that's no. not our fault. It's no. just biology. That's it. You know, it's just biology and women. Unfortunately, they face a different stigma. I can't begin to tell you women that I know in their 40s that have a career that are successful. But you know what? They're not. They haven't. They've never been married. They've never had children. You know, that's something that that's a stigma that's hard to beat, bro. I feel I feel bad for women because they don't they don't they don't get it as bad as we do. Yeah, we might get off. Oh, Fernando's a, a bachelor. Oh, Fernando's a child. He, does, he doesn't want to grow up. Well, I have. I mean, I have grown up. I mean, I own property. I I'm self-sufficient. I have money. I mean, I'm fine. But at the end of the day, it's nowhere near the stigma and the scorn that women face. Yeah, it, it it's tough. Do you think, you know, speaking about women during in that age group? Obviously, you know, they would be I'm sure there's exceptions, but obviously they would be single at long period of times. You, you do you think that's a red flag if they're if a woman is single for a long period of time, let's say two years plus three years plus, et cetera? My dad told me once if a woman is single and she's hot, there's something wrong with her. OK, there's something wrong with her somewhere. Somehow there's a man not willing to put up with her bullshit anymore. OK, that's that, that, let's talk real. OK, that happens a lot. And I've dated women, and I have. Listen, my best friend is one of the hottest Colombian women you'll ever see. She's your best friends. Yeah. 
Okay, and she, uh, wait, wait, wait. All right, she's in her early 50s, and this is the hottest, one of the hottest Colombian women you'll ever, ever Fernando, see. Fernando, hold on. Sure, sure. All right, so, 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 so that's, all right, so that's, something, that's something that I could disagree with. So I, I honestly do not think men and women can be friends, but you just said best friends. I, yeah. I think acquaintances, yes, but best friends, because just at the end of the day, I think biologically and in the inside, men are either going to be friends with a woman with a woman to be waiting on the sidelines to be in the sidelines to be friend zoned and then eventually sleep with her when the opportunity arises or it's just a coworker, you know it's a client it's this and that and, and that's it it's an acquaintance but you just said best friends can you explain that dynamic how, how can I can't understand, and I don't disagree with it. But you know, again, we could disagree here. This, you know, we're we're, sure, we're sure, two sure. educated, intelligent sure, men. Absolutely. How can a man and a woman be best friends? Well, I would argue that in my scenario, and, and I'm not going to drop her name here; uh, she'll kill me. But I mean, eventually she'll watch her show. She'll know what I'm referring to. But um, we have a healthy respect for each other, where you know we see eye to eye in a lot of things. But you know, my goals are are, are different about how I approach dating. And I, and I say this without trying to sound smug or arrogant or whatever. You know, I've dated enough in my life. I think I've dated for two men in my lifetimes. I approach dating differently for some years now because my goals are different. You know, the idea of getting laid and that's something that when you're in your 20s, like it's, oh my God, it's, it, it's something that is expedient. You need to get this done. Even in your 30s, you know, you date, you, you know, I mean, I was a serial dater forever. And I still dated, I, I still had some long-term relationships, but... The idea is that as you get older and you realize you've dated enough, you look at dating differently and what my goals are and what I'm looking to do. And in the case in point with my best friend, like she understands me. She understands my quirks, super protective of me. Uh, never really liked any woman I've ever dated. She's always been very, very sort of like specific, like, okay. I wonder why. Uh, no, actually, you know what? It's funny. It's not always that scenario because you're thinking like behind the scenes, like what does she want? Like, this is the thing. Like, I adore her to death, but our life goals are different. Like, she, for example, and she's going to hate me bringing up her stuff, but, like, she's already been a mom. She has two full-grown sons. Over 18? Oh, yeah. Like, we're talking about, like, late 20s. Okay. Like, like these are full-blown adult males. Is she has she, a granddaughter. Is she single? What's that? Yeah, she's single, yeah. And this is the thing where her life goals are different. She's already had children. She's not interested in that. She, her, 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 her goals are owning a house, which she just did, and I congratulate her for that. She just bought a house. She's looking to advance in her career. She's not looking to settle down, per se, have a family, and that's not something that interested. After she had her sons years ago, that's it. She never wanted to procreate again. So when she, so when we would talk all the time and look at, well, do we prospectively like make a good match or we don't? We don't because our, our life goals are different. It doesn't mean that I can't still care about her. It doesn't mean I still can't hold her in high regard and she can understand me or I can understand her. Yeah, like we... We function that way, you know, not because she's on the sidelines, nor am I on the sidelines hoping like, no, like I, I date serially and, and she always tries to give me guidance like, well, if and then like, okay, be careful with A, B and C because I know you and you know what? Like, let me ask you a question, sure. Fernando. Sure. Have you guys, have you guys ever had a history? Uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 All right. no. All right. I trust you, Fernando. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right. Um. Okay. Well, you know, we could agree to disagree, but again, from I listen, I'm I'm gonna keep an open mind. I I understand in that that specific scenario, and that's in that specific scenario when I understand. You know, she's she's had her kids; they're older now. She doesn't. She's not looking for more kids, and then you're looking to have kids. Mm -hmm. So I understand that dynamic, but really, but but. but Best friends, like I, I I'm, I'm mind blown. And it's funny. I mean, you, you do, do you have a male best friend? Oh yeah, uh, I have about three of them. Yeah, yeah, like from childhood. Yeah, okay. I have like three buddies that like. So is it, let me let me pick. I never had a female best friend. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe maybe I could get educated and then I could seek a female best friend here. Okay. All right. Um, have you shared? Have you shared anything? Have you shared anything with? Your female best friend that you never shared with your male best friend? Uh, probably yeah. Like maybe like for example, um, being heartbroken over a relationship. You know, right? So like a few years back, like uh, a relationship I was in for some time soured, 
And uh, it really rocked me. Like, it really rocked me because I was looking to marry this woman and it didn't work out. And that's okay. You know, you take, as a guy, listen, a guy who says he's never taken L's in dating. No, you is take lying. L's. Fuck you take that. L's all no. the time. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're used to it. Yeah, absolutely. This yeah. will make us guys. Absolutely. Experience, tell you. And, and I remember that during that summer when I was really recovering emotionally, where I was, I was a mess. Like, I was like, I was really, really upset. I was like reevaluating, like, well, what could I have done better? Like, we, we start doing that Monday morning quarterbacking, right? About like, well, what could you have done better? If I had done this, could we have worked out? And at the end of the day, like, these are conversations that I can have with her because she's a woman. Again, the nurturer, right? The the idea of, well, I'm a woman and, you know, I can tell you exactly whether or not this was going to work out, Fernando. As opposed to my buddies were like, F that bitch and, you know what, she she had a good thing with you and she's toxic, she's A, B, and C, which, you know, again, a lot of my friends had lots of opinions of my exes, right, where they, they didn't always act right and they were toxic or this or that. You know, she wasn't like that. She was like, listen, own your culpability and why this relationship went south. She may never do that. Hey, that's on her. But you own your shit. Mm. As opposed to my buddies were like, well, you know, she's, come on, bro, like, you know, you're a good catch. You have A, B, and C. You know, give me a break. She didn't want to marry you. That's her loss. You know, she'll she'll say that to me, but in a much sort of smoother way where, hey, listen, yeah, I get it. She lost out on you. But understand that, like, moving forward, you need to have a healthier perspective of dating. My, my buddies, again, I love them to death, but they're not going to say that to me. Because what happened? Because what ended up happening after that relationship soured, my one buddy was like, you know what? We're going to Vegas. Let's go Liberty Weekend. F her. Let's go. Let's forget about her. Let's just go crazy in Vegas. And we did. We went Liberty Weekend for five days. There's stuff that I'm glad that, you know, I won't talk about openly. And there's videos out there that are on my cloud and they're going to stay there. But the point is that, like, did the weekend help? Oh, absolutely. I I forgot about it real quick. (laughs) But then once once the plane landed in Newark, I said, okay, I need to sort of recoup my life again. Yeah, reality check. And as opposed to talking to her, my best friend, she was like, listen, you got that out of your system. That's great. Please approach dating in a healthier way. Don't just date someone for the sake of, okay, cause I'm, I'm very much an idealist when it comes to the, to, to the romance and, you know, oh, it's going to work out. We just work at it. Love wins. Love, no, love doesn't always win. I've loved a lot of exes of mine. But looking back, I'm glad they didn't work out the way it did because it would have... Like, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Like, I would not be progressing where I'm at right now in media. I would not be progressing where I am professionally because I know for a fact that had certain relationships worked out, I would have been stagnant. And for the sake of, well, I'm happy and we had the happily ever after, it doesn't work that way. So in, in the respect to my best friend, she's like at least intellectually honest, honest, honest enough to say to me, hey, listen, you know what? From now on, be healthier. You're a little more vigilant now. You, you can detect the red flags. You've always been good at detecting red flags, but stay true to you. Like, don't just settle and don't just be like, because, you know, you don't, she was like, you don't have a trouble, you don't have trouble meeting women. For as long as I've known you, you've always dated good looking women. Now, some exes might disagree and say, well, you know, not every ex is good looking. No, they've all been good looking, you know, but she's always been very supportive and, and consoling, as opposed to my buddies who I love them to death, but, you know, at the end of the day, they're guys. They're going to be like, well, just get someone new and you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel that. Um, now, my take on what women bring to the table or what they should bring to the table for whoever's interested, because, you know, Fernando, bro, I, I couldn't have said it any better. But just to kind of like make an argument sake, you know, um, you said someone who is uh, well put together and honestly an adult. We don't want to be babysitting. We don't want a child. I mean, we've been through that. Right? I mean, like when I was in my 30s, I loved dating like mid- girls in their mid 20s because, you know, they're hot, they're young, they're tight. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. And it's great. But, you know, you do have to babysit. Yeah. When you're dating a woman in the 30s or 40s, it's a different maturity level. Right, 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 right. Um, so exactly. So I would want an adult. You know, I would be looking for a mother figure because, again, you know, I'm going into the 30s now very soon and... Now it's getting to a point where my attractive traits are kind of just lingering around. And it's not only just attractiveness like, you know, when you're in your early 20s. It's yeah, just more. Not just the visual. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's more. All right. You know, if, you know, I, I do want kids. But if I choose you to be, you know, the mother of my kids, can you be a mother? Can you not be a mother? Is my mother going to be an OnlyFans person? Is she going to be clapping her cheeks on Instagram? No, I do not want that. No. You know? I, I would be scarred if I saw some old videos of my mother doing that shit. Like, I'd be scarred. Likewise, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, 
and loyalty. I would need some loyalty. Um, and just to add a little spice into it, I would want low mileage. You know, I I don't want to go into an event or a restaurant or a club where half the guys there know my girlfriend or know my wife, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's something that that's almost like a They know where that little tattoo is located, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So like it's it, it's almost like the competitiveness in me where another man could actually be a one up, you know, and have a point over me, you know, like I, I just don't want that. Well, I mean, let's, let's be fair, and I, and I don't want to sound like I'm acquiescing here to to to, to, to feminism and, or anything else, but like, again, it, it sort of goes back to gender roles, like the, the the way that men are viewed and our behaviors are 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 conceptualized are very different. The idea that you know when men have sex with multiple women in, the, in during their adult lives, like that's not looked down upon negatively at all. For women, you know, if you've had a lot of mileage. And, and, you know, you've had more turns in a doorknob, okay, and, or more miles in Route 3 on you. I, I, this is the thing, you know, yeah, there's a right or wrong. It's just real. There's a perception that, like, do, is this a woman I want to build a future with? Is this a woman that I know? Listen, I know plenty of buddies of mine that have dated women, and whether it's going to, like, hot venues like Ventana's in Fort Lee, Waterside in North Bergen, or places in Hoboken, whatever, I can just tell you, like, buddies of mine that be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I started seeing this girl. And I'll look at her, and I'm a pretty sociable person. Like, I, I know a lot. Of, I'm not saying this to be smug. I know a lot of people in Hudson Bergen counties. I know them. And when I see women walking around and either they're, they're dating someone, the first thing comes to mind, I'm like, wow, okay, all right. And I try not to be too judgmental because at the end of the day, you know, I've had girlfriends say to me, you know, Fern, like, Jesus, babe, like, my God, like you've gotten around like a fucking towel rag here. Like what? The, what's going on? And I was like, well, who says that? Women or men? Uh, I've I've had some girlfriends when when we've had those combos. Like, hey, so, you know, I've either known someone you hooked up with, or you know, what's what's your number? What's your trips? Because at the end of the day, when you're asked, hey, how many how many times you've been to Vegas? How many times you've been to Miami? How many times you've been in Los Angeles? Am I going to Vegas to go rock climbing? Am I going to Vegas to go watch Cirque du Soleil? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to get ass. Yeah, I'm, gonna, go, I'm going to the clubs, the pool parties with right. my one ab, okay? Because I can't find the other five. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm trying to work them. <laughs> you know. But what am I doing? I'm going to because I want to get ass. Because that's what you go to Vegas. And women do the same thing. Women go to Vegas. It's their getaway. It's a party, yeah. And they want to party too. But again, it, it's right or wrong, bro. It's just it's one of those unfortunate realities. Women face a different stigma than we do. You know, I always said that. You know, a, a man. A man would want you know, an innocent woman or a woman who has low mileage. But I would argue that a woman will want someone who's experienced, a man who's experienced. What woman would want a man who's a virgin or a man who doesn't know the dynamics of a relationship? Because guess what, ladies? At the end of the day, we're only going to be experienced if we're going to be, let's say, hoeing around or being a fuckboy at some point. <laughs> let's let, let's be fair. That's right. Yeah, let's that's be fair. Right, yeah, and right. you know, once we get over that hump or that phase, we'll be able and um, acknowledge the fact. Okay, I did my shit. Now it's time to settle down and have some kids. I don't know about marriage, but mm -hmm. settle down and have some kids and build that legacy. Um, so, with that being said, um, I would want to thank you, Fernando, to. Uh, for actually spending the time with me attacking the dating market um, and putting your twist and your perspectives into it. Is there anything you want to say to the followers, the new friends, and uh, the people that are watching out there? All right, I'll try to be as concise as I can. Uh, folks, check out Real Talk on Monday nights via Jersey First TV on YouTube. Also on Facebook Live via StreamYard. You can't miss me on Facebook. I'm the handsome guy with the Joe Biden sucks t-shirt on it, so you can't miss me. And also on Blog Talk Radio for Talking the Hudson, which you can check out blogtalkradio.com slash Talking the Hudson. And I just want to thank you, Brian, because I think this has been a very insightful conversation. You've you've been a great host, a great questions, and I, th I really, really like the fluidity of this conversation. But one thing I really, really want to hammer home here, especially because we've talked about dating, we've talked about the importance of relationships and our futures, right, as men and also for women out there. You know, do your homework. You know, make sure that... As we're getting older, make good life choices with your partners because as, as we do get older, you know, there's so much stress we have in our lives, whether it's our jobs, whether it's our quality of life, cost of living, everything else, politics. The last thing you need is stress from your partner. You want to be able to go home 
and come home to someone that is going to make you a better person. And I know I sound very, very sort of lovey-dovey right now because I don't come off that way. But when it comes to picking a partner, pick a man or a woman that is going to bring out the best in you and, and, and not bring you down. And when you, bring, when, you, when you meet that partner, again, it's one of those things where a lot of different avenues open up for you professionally, mental health-wise, socially. And we can't minimize that enough. Find that partner that's the best fit for you. And don't feel like a rush. If you don't find him or her right away, it'll come. Folks, again, there's somebody for everybody. We just have to do the mileage and, and, and do the homework and cut our teeth and put the time in. And if we do that, I think we'll all get that happy ending that we deserve. Amen. Amen, Fernando. Uh, on that, let's make a toast and or take a toast. Why don't you grab two shot glasses, any shot glasses okay, okay. Um, to toast on what you just said because I couldn't have said it any better. And uh, I'm sure whiskey's okay. Oh, yeah. I love whiskey. All right. Grow hair on your chest. You know what I'm saying? So. Fernando, it's been a pleasure um, hosting you. It's been a pleasure hearing your perspectives. I agree with most, if not all, bro. And Appreciate I hope that, I you. hope you could come back. I hope I could go on your panel again. And uh, I'll see you soon, bro. Absolutely. Okay? Bro. Listen, bro. Salute to your success. And salute to yours more, bro. Uh, guys, um, it's been a pleasure. Salute to you guys. And... Um, don't forget to follow Fernando. Don't forget to subscribe to his channel as well. Um, subscribe to this channel. Like this video. It will help out with the analytics and um, the push out there. And uh, thank you for sitting next to us and listening to our facts about manhood, about toxic masculinity. That's right. That's right. And um, the dating market. All right. I love you all. Have a good night.